Are you teaching in high school, grade school, or are you teaching in an all boys class or an all girls class? What subject are you teaching? Are you teaching math, science, English, or probably history or social studies, ICT? I could mention all the subject areas. But whatever subject you're teaching, I believe whatever group you may be categorized in as teachers, there is only one question, probably the most important question. How do we understand our learners? How do we understand our students? And so today, we are going to discuss how do we actually understand our learners. Because as teachers, I believe what we want is to make the most out of our students so that they can achieve their full potential once they go out of the school, once they, chose, once they have chosen their own careers. I think as teachers, we have all experienced a certain moment of reflection after checking our test papers. We see one test paper and then this student did not seem to learn anything. And so with all our disappointments, we go on to the next paper and check, yes, another student did not learn from me. And we go on to check another test paper and lo and behold, there's another score. He got a perfect score. And so if those students did not learn from me, how come this student, by the way, this student doesn't even recite in school. This student doesn't even participate. You see, even my student, but he got a perfect score. So it seems that we really have a different set of learners, even if they belong to the same classroom. Even in one single classroom where all are, maybe all are girls, all our boys are maybe in a mixed classroom, there are subtle differences. Thank God for that student who got a perfect score. And so we move on to another test paper. Okay, passing score. We move on to another test paper and lo, another perfect score. We go on to another test paper and never mind because he didn't answer anything. We move on to another test paper and after checking all the test papers, we get three perfect scores. We get 10 failing scores. Most of them will be average scores. As a teacher, we would be happy with those three perfect scores, right? I see nodding faces. I see nodding heads. Okay, but wouldn't it be nice if all our students would be able to pass the test? We would not be limited those, to those three top students. As teachers, I believe that we should be able to target all of our students. It would be injustice if we would only be catering to a few. George Evans, a noted educator, once said, every student can learn, not just on the same day or the same way. So if we look at our test papers, probably we would be thinking, those three students who got perfect scores learned something from us, and we would be jubilant about that. But come to think of it, those who failed, maybe, just maybe, we could have done something. The better thing is, or the good thing is, we could still do something. Because probably those who did not pass, well, I would rather say those who did not pass yet, they are bound to pass sooner or later. And as teachers, I believe we should pursue that possibility. Of course, we want all our students to succeed, don't we? And so the question is, how do we become effective teachers? I believe all educators, all teachers since time immemorial have always been concerned with how they can effectively teach. Otherwise, they would have been out of the profession at any given time. Tomlinson and Maktai identified four elements of effective teaching. The first, of course, is the content, what you teach. If you're teaching math, you would be teaching them equations, lines, points, etc., etc. Or if you're teaching science at the grade school level, you'll be teaching them about parts of the body, anatomy, and so on and so forth. You should be an expert of your content if you want to be an effective teacher. But that is not the only component, that's not the only element to become an effective teacher. The other is how you teach. So it's not enough that you're an expert in what you're teaching. It's not enough that you're an expert in science. It's not enough that you're an expert in biology or you're a rocket scientist for that matter. Equally important it is how you teach your students. 
equally important is how you make your students understand you. Because that is why you are a teacher. You are an expert, but at the same time, you have to be able to impart your expertise, your knowledge to the students that you are teaching. But there are four elements. Whom you teach? The students. So we should know what we teach. We should know how we are to teach. But then again, it's also important, if not the most important, that we know who we are teaching. We know who our students are. We know what makes them tick. And of course, we have the learning environment. If only we could make our learning environment so um, conducive to learning, that would make us an effect, or that would help us to become an effective teacher. But it's not just the learning element. It's not just the environment. It's the content or what you teach. It's the instruction or how you teach the learning environment, as I've mentioned before, or where you teach. But for today, I would like to focus on the most important thing. I believe is the most important thing. Because the other three, we could learn it from school. When we were studying to become teachers, we mastered our content. And with all the seminars available, we could continue to advance our skill, our knowledge in mastering content. We could continue to search, Google different ways on how to have different strategies that would cater to different students. But all of these would be useless if we would not know our students. As we have mentioned, as teachers, what we want is to be an effective teacher and be able to understand our students better. And to be able to understand our students better, we want to know how they actually differ. Student A would not be the same as student B. And more so, if there would be another student, student C, they would be somewhat different from each other. Now, we know that it is not a good idea or it would not always work if there's only one strategy. Of course, we have to vary because in a differentiated classroom, we want to differentiate content process and product so that we would be able to cater to the different needs of our students. And so, we want to know how our students actually vary. The categories of student variance. First would be biology. When we say biology is a variance, there are different aspects that we are to consider. We have gender, neurological wiring for learning, we have abilities and disabilities, we have preferences. These all affect how our students are actually learning, how our students are actually accepting what we teach, how they're actually receptive to what we say in the classroom, or how they're actually learning from the different activities that they are performing. High ability and disability would exist in a wide range of endeavors. And of course, those students with higher ability, we would not expect them to have the same output as those students with a not so high ability. They will learn in different modes. Some will learn better if they listen. Some will learn better if they watch. Some would not be able to learn with either by watching or listening. Some would better learn by doing. And of course, there are other parameters for learning like they would prefer a certain topic and they would be very much engaged in pursuing that topic. But if they would not really be interested in that, it would take a whole lot of effort for them to get engaged in their activities. And all of these have something to do not with the classroom, not with the instruction, not with the content. It has something to do with how they were actually wired, how they're actually made. We also have to consider differences in terms of degree of privilege. Students, learners, have differences in economic status, race, culture, support system, language, and experience. For example, students from low socioeconomic status or backgrounds representing races or cultures and languages that are not in positions of power face greater school challenges. One case, if we have students coming from outside Manila, and if that student would be studying in Manila, of course, we would not expect the same performance from that student who came from the province if he or she would be transferring to a Manila school. This is not 
a discriminatory comment. It's a reality. It's a variance that we have to consider. The degree of privilege affects how students are learning from us. Despite all the strategies that we employ, despite our expertise in our content, if we do not consider how students are privileged or their lack of privilege, all of these might not really be effective. The position for learning also affects how students learn from school. Adult models, trust, self-concept, motivation, temperament, and interpersonal skills. Parents who actively commend education positively affect their children's learning. For sure, we have heard of stories wherein a father would discourage a female child to study farther. We have heard of familiar stories like, mag-aasawa ka lang naman, huwag ka nang mag-college. These are not stories from telenovela. These stories are happening. These stories are happening in other countries. Sadly, it's also happening here. And if we do not consider these different situations, we would not be as effective as teachers that we want to be. Preferences. Of course, students' interests will vary across topics and across subjects. Their interests, learning preferences, as well as preferences for individuals would greatly affect how they study and how they actually master the skills that we need them to master. If they would be more interested in science, expect them to excel in science. If they would be interested in music, they would be expected to excel in music. Most probably, fail behind in their other subjects. But expect them to excel in whatever that interests them. If they want a certain technique, for example, some students want discussion. And if a teacher uses discussion, they would be greatly interested in the subject and probably learn better. Also, they tend to <clears throat> appreciate certain teachers better than the rest. And so it should not be, it should not cause a bad feeling for us because if they prefer a certain teacher, expectedly they would be more motivated to learn. While it's not our objective to be likable to our students, but we should also be considerate on how they would actually be interested in how a particular teacher would teach them because it greatly affects how they learn, their preferences. Now, all of these, our goal is content mastery and performance mastery. We want them to master, we want them to learn all the knowledge and skills that they want them to learn. We want them to perform according to the standards. And if we want them to do so, we should consider all four of the variances. Biology, degree of privilege, position for learning, as well as their different preferences. In a, different, in a differential classroom, teachers would want to maximize how they can actually address these subtle differences in order to make their students understand their lessons better. This is differentiated instruction. Differentiated instruction focuses on three things. Whom we teach, where we teach, and how we teach. Sounds familiar, right? These three are actually some of the elements of effective teaching that was discussed by Tomlinson and Maktai in their book. Whom you teach, the students, would be an important factor. Where you teach, or the learning environment, and how you teach, the instructions. How we actually engage them to study how we actually uh, engage or compose activities that they would perform in order for them to learn better. So we focus first on whom we teach. Differentiated instruction in focusing students means giving students multiple options for taking information. Of course, if students would prefer something that they would hear, we would want to give them something that they would hear. Those students who want to learn with what they see, we would be giving them more visual cues 
so that they would learn better. We are considering these differences because we want to engage our students, we want our students to learn better. Differentiated instruction also considers where you teach or the learning environment. We consider the diverse physical locations, contexts, and cultures in which students learn. Students coming from a particular area would learn differently from another area. Students who would be adapting a different culture would need to adjust, and so they would need to learn. Students who come from a far-flung area coming to Manila would need to adjust. And we should consider all those things in differentiated instructions. And of course, this is where we come in, how we teach. Differentiated instruction ensures that we, teachers, focus on processes and procedures that ensure effective learning for varied individuals. So, differentiated instruction is actually our way of making sure that varied students would have different options to learn because we are considering their differences. The important goal is, the main thing is, we want them to learn. And so we give them what, we, what they need. We give them the chance to learn in a way that would most suit them. In the next modules, we would be concerned with how technology can address differentiated instruction.